second fiddle to sushi. You know, and so it's it's cute. You know, I, I feel something is fishy here. You know, I'm thinking, oh, couldn't resist. Sorry. It is a pleasure to be here with you in Rochester, New York. I experienced a lovely Friday night with the community. We spoke about Jewish humor and Judaism. Uh, this morning we had a beautiful Shabbos Kiddush and Rachim. And the topic was how to pray. And this evening's talk is on, to be precise, it is on the oral law, Jewish tradition. How can something that was created by humans be infallible? Can we not question that maybe there were some mistakes? And that is really the topic for tonight. Uh, if I could have one of those pamphlets, I may, no, 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 one second, is that a spear? It's a spear. Okay. I like pink. It's nice. Very nice. I'd like to extend again a, a mazel tov once more to Rabbi David Abba Muchkin, Rabbi Muchkin, his parents who are here, his wife. I must tell you that tomorrow I'm leaving back, unfortunately, to California, where I live now. And uh, Rabbi and Mrs. Muchkin from Rochester have treated me in a magnificent way. The food here, delicacies and delicious. It's been a pleasure if I would have known that this is one of the top places of cuisine, Jewish cooking, I would have perhaps come here a little earlier because for years when I lived in Ottawa, I used to travel from Ottawa to Cleveland where my parents lived. I used to pass by Rochester. And if I would have known that this is the type of uh, food here, I would have perhaps stopped before now. But we are blessed living in the United States, and I've said it a few times. In California, there is a very serious discussion and debate going on about illegal immigrants. And uh, we Jewish people have benefited from becoming American citizens. I'd like to tell you a quick little story <coughs> about a Jewish family that came over from Europe. We're going back about 30 years. And he was speaking to a friend of his who was here a few years before, and he said, to him, ah, I'm going to say it only in English from now, but he spoke to him in Yiddish. He says, you're so lucky. You're an American citizen, and I cannot become an American citizen. And he answered him back in Yiddish, why can't you become an American citizen? He says, come, come, I barely speak a few words of English. How am I going to learn and prepare to get the citizenship exam? And he said to him, there's nothing to it. What are you talking about? Anybody can become a citizen. I became a citizen. I can speak barely a few more words of English than you. They ask every single immigrant who comes for the test the exact same questions, without any exception. The first question that they ask him is, uh, uh, what is uh, your name? The second question they ask is, how many children do you have? Third question ask, who is the first president of the United States? <coughs> Fourth question they ask, how many states are there? And the fifth question they ask everybody, are your parents still alive? Chit chat, that's all you have to do. Just memorize all those answers and go in with a little American flag. And so it was, he made an appointment and he went in with a little American flag with a big smile on his face, confident that he will be able to get his citizenship. And the first question he's asked by his interrogate, I mean his, his uh, government official, he says, who was the first president of the United States? And he says, Mendel Goldwasser. <laughs> and he says, that was his name. And they asked him, and tell me, how many states are there in the United States? He says, five states. He says, what is your name? George Washington. <laughs> and how many children do you have? Fifty. <laughs> he says, who's crazy? Me or you, sir? He says, both of us, thank God, both of us. <laughs> so why do I tell you this story? Because understanding how Judaism works is not a question of memorizing a few principles. Understanding how we came to Jewish observance to this very day, it's not a question of just, you learn a few answers, it's down pat, but you have to understand the system. It requires study and an immersion in the study. Tonight, instead of immersing yourself in study, 
You're going to listen to me for a few moments, and with God's help, you'll be able to get a basic parameter of how Jewish custom, tradition, and law developed. You will also be able to, and I'd like the format to be like this. I'm going to talk, and after the talk, I'd like to entertain a few questions. And the questions can be preferably, as I mentioned today, on the topic, or it can be on whatever you want. But I hope I will elicit some curiosity. First of all, I start with this serious question. How did Judaism get so complicated? If you follow the narrative of the Torah, the narrative of the Torah was that God created a world. God created the world. He demanded from the human race, which consisted of Adam and Eve, one mitzvah, believe me, trust in me, do this mitzvah, then that one mitzvah evolved into the seven Noahite laws, seven mitzvahs, and then it evolved into 613 mitzvahs, and then it evolved to 620 mitzvahs, and the seven rabbinic laws, 613 from the Torah, and that's only the beginning. Then there are minhogim, customs, and there are traditions, and there are gezeres, decrees, and there are extra stringencies, and there is extra siyogim, the extra fences and protection. What happened to our religion? What changed it? How did it become so complicated? And just to know what the 613 commandments are, there were a few great scholars, the Rambam, Maimonides, he articulated in his Sefer HaMitzvahs, his book of, of all of the mitzvahs, what are the 613 mitzvahs, the Smag, which was Rav Moshe from Kusi, articulated 613 mitzvahs. You have to be a giant of a scholar just to know all of the mitzvahs, let alone all of the customs. It's impossible to know. So what changed in Judaism? And the answer is one word. Sinai. Sinai changed everything. The experience at Mount Sinai, the receiving of the Torah, the master plan of the Creator became manifest. As the Torah tells us in a verse, Vayered Hashem, and God descended, Vayal Moshe, and Moshe went up the mountain, that there was a process that began at Sinai that no more was it just a question of believing and having faith and having trust in God, but the mandate of the human race, which were represented by the Jewish people, was to effectively transform the world and take the world and make out of it a different reality. Bear with me a moment. Whereas the abstract, the mitzvahs, the commandments are abstract, we're taught them, we read about them, we learn about them, and then there's reality. The sushi we're going to eat is reality. If it comes, maybe it's abstract now, but hopefully it'll come. From Buffalo, it's a long journey, let me tell you. But the world in front of our eyes is reality. And what Judaism wants is the transformation that the abstract concepts of goodness and kindness and observances should become reality. And the world, which seems to be reality, should become a little bit less reality by us in abstract. That when a Jew, for example, observes Yom Kippur, and it becomes real by him, Yom Kippur, and he stops work, and he goes to the synagogue, and he spends it a day in prayer, there was no policeman forcing you to do that. It's an abstract concept. The Torah says that the Yom Kippur should be observed. And when that becomes reality in your life, of importance, or the Shabbat, or any of the precepts becomes reality, instead of being something abstract, when the energy of spirituality becomes matter, and the matter of the physical world becomes a little bit less matter, a little bit less of the physicality. There was a great rabbi, his name was Rabbi Yitzhak of Bardichev. He once had a complaint to God. He said, God, it's not fair. It's not fair. The joys of Torah 
and observance and of Judaism are all in the books. And you have to open the book, you have to read the book, you have to then experience what it says in the book, and the pleasures of the world are very much in front of our eyes. We taste them. Why didn't you make it just the opposite? That the pleasures and joys of being a Jew and observing the mitzvot, are, we taste it and we feel it, and they're tangible and they're manifest in front of our eyes. And the pleasures of the world, the pleasures of having financial wherewithal to do whatever you want, that's something you read about in the books and you don't really see it and taste it. So what was really happening with Sinai, that the mandate and the ability of a person to effectively create a different reality in the world. And that reality is that the presence of God. And this is something, whether you're observant, 100%, 90%, 10%, 2%, regardless of your religiosity, every Jew, it is as if he walks with a, with a, with a flag, like Neil Armstrong, when he landed on the moon and he planted it, one giant step, small step, United States flag, every Jew walks the face of the earth with a flag that says, I'm a Jew, and there's a God in the world. I heard from the Prime Minister of Canada many years ago, the Prime Minister then was Pierre Elliott Trudeau, that when he sees a Jew, he was a Catholic, a devout Catholic, he says when he sees a Jew, it reminds him that God is real, and that there's a God in the he knows, he knows the Bible and the, Torah, the Bible that he was taught speaks about the Jewish people, the children of God. When he sees a Jew, it means they're around, they're still. It means in this world there is a presence of the Jew, there's a presence of God. That is the reality, part of the reality that we're trying to achieve. When you take a look at the, at the, at the Mishkan, if you, read, if you watch the readings of the Torah, the readings of the Torah that talks about the structure and the building of the tabernacle. You say to yourself, my goodness, so much detail. I mean, so much nuance. Almost, uh, you wonder to say, who needs to know this? That it was this big and that big, how they constructed this, how they constructed that. It seems that God is more interested in, in the hooks and in the curtains and the poles and in the pegs and everything that went together to put together this miskin, this sanctuary. And yet, if you think about it, life itself is about the investment of detail. Did you buy the right insurance? Do you have the right health insurance? Did you invest in the proper pension plan? <coughs> life is about details. Reality is detail. <coughs> And therefore, the Torah in our observances wants the detail to make Judaism, to make godliness, to make spirituality not something in your heart, but really you can do whatever you want. But rather, it should become real to you. And therefore, the detail is very, very important because it inculcates with that this is something that is real. And therefore, you have the byproduct and the reality that Jews who observe, whatever your level of observance is, that observance is something real and important. I would like to now chart for you some three important steps in the development of Jewish law that began at Sinai. Sinai was the Jewish people stood at the foot of Mount Sinai on the 50th day after they left their Egyptian slavery, which they, their sojourn in Egypt was for a serious significant amount of time the generations were born in, Jun in Egypt as slave, slaves, and this was the preparation for them to receive the Torah. And they exchanged the yoke of slavery of man to be liberated and to be free people, but to accept responsibility in making the world a better place. And I would like to chart three important points. Number one, Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, he was appointed by God to be the one who gets, who receives the Torah and transmits it to the Jewish people. Moses receives the Torah, the Torah, and I'm going to explain what that means momentarily, but he is the one who has been the one appointed by God to receive the Torah and transmit it to the Jewish people. Number two, Judaism 
is unique from any other religion because it is the only religion that every man, woman, and child who is Jewish experienced the revelation at Sinai. Millions of people. There's a number of 600,000. That's the number of men that were at Sinai of military age, 20 to 60. But there were millions of people at Sinai who heard, I am the Lord your God, who heard you shall have no other gods, who heard what the world refers to as the Ten Commandments, which is the Decalogue. Why did it have to be? No other religion has it. Every religion has some type of a revelation experience. But there was a handful of disciples that saw. There was a handful of people that saw. But Judaism is that every single man and woman participated in that vision, in that experience. Why? So it should be impossible to say it was fabricated. Everyone was there. And now with time is a question of how do we know that happened. But nevertheless... That experience was an experience that every single Jewish person. And the third point is that every detail of Jewish observance is virtually ambiguous from the Torah. And really, we need to have some type of an explanation, not an interpretation, but an explanation. For example, everybody is familiar with the mezuzah. But what does it say in the Torah? which is explicitly telling you that you should have a mezuzah on your doors. It says, Uchetavtam al mezuzot betecha uvisharecha. What does that mean? And you shall write it on your doorposts, in your house and in your gateways. What am I supposed to do? I know I'm supposed to do something. It's very explicit. Do something. And it's called a mezuzah. And ironically, even though there are today, unfortunately, or reality, there are many different denominations in Judaism, even though Judaism only has one denomination, being Jewish, and different levels of observance. But everybody means well, and everybody attempts to do something that is very important, whether it's Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Reconstruction, or any other new dimension or experience in Judaism. Nobody has come up with a new mezuzah. Nobody has come with it that you don't put it on the door. Nobody has come with a different type of script. Everybody knows the mezuzah is written, the Shema, the first two chapters of Shema, and you put it on your doorpost, and you put it on a slant, and if you have somebody who is not observant and he has it not slanted, and you tell it to them that it's not slanted properly, you tell it to them, and generally speaking, they change it. They try to do it in, in, in the way that is prescribed. Tefillin. Nobody has come up with a different definition of tefillin. Tefillin, you know, it's not really those black boxes. Yes, some people say women should put them on. Some people should also put them on. There's some people you can put it on before bar mitzvah and, and so on and so forth. But nobody has said tefillin is something. Somebody else has come up with green boxes of tefillin that have inside of it different, different messages. That means somehow, notwithstanding, that the Torah does not tell us in a clear way. It's ambiguous. What are you supposed to do? And you look through all the mitzvahs of the Torah, you'll find that ambiguity that is there. So those are three points. We need an oral tradition that tells us what to do. And now we're going to jump into what are the, how did this oral tradition develop. First of all, the Rambam Maimonides. So we got these three points. Moses, appointed to transmit the Torah. Point number two, anybody remember? That everybody was there at Sinai. Point number three, that the written law, everything is, needs an explanation of what you're supposed to do. The Rambam Maimonides, in his, in, in his, in his preface to the Pirish HaMishnayas, in his preface to this, his commentary on Mishnah, says as follows, every mitzvah that God gave to Moses, he gave it to him with his explanation. That God said, this that is going to be in the Torah, this that you're going to write down in the Torah, this is the way it's supposed to be observed. Number two, it's important to know who wrote the Torah. Moses wrote the Torah. The dictation, he, it was dictated by God to him. And Moses wrote the Torah before he died in the desert. That is our tradition. And he wrote it, he transmitted it, he taught it, and God explained when he taught him the Torah exactly 
what is the meaning of these mitzvahs? What is the meaning of mitzvahs? What is the meaning of Shabbat? What is the meaning of, of, of tzitzis? What is the meaning of kashrut? Moses explained this to the people. Now, I'm giving you the structure. You don't have to agree with what I'm presenting to you, but you have to understand what is the view of how this structure developed. And then we can get into a dialogue. I'd like you to open up your pink books, pink pamphlets. And the very first page is a page from the book of Leviticus. And at the top of the page, it says verse 46. And here the verse states as follows. Ela hachukim, these are the decrees. Bahamishpatim, these are the ordinances. Order, ordinances. Bahatoros and the Torahs, asher nosan Hashem beino, ubein b'nei Yisrael, that God gave to, from himself to the Jewish people. Bahar Sinai and Mount Sinai, in the hands of Moses. I want you to take a look at the commentary Rashi. You see at the, in the middle of the page, it has Rashi elucidated, and it has verse 46. The obvious question when you look at that verse, what does the Bible mean? What does the Torah mean when it says, Bahatoros, in the plural? The Torahs. God gave over the Torahs? There's one Torah. The five books of Moses. And Rashi explains what is it, the meaning of these words, the plural world Torahs refer to the two parts of Torah. Achas Biksav, the written and the oral. So by Judaism, different than by Christendom, who also, and different than by Islam, who they all accept the divinity of the Bible, of the five books of Moses. But Judaism says that the Bible is not understandable, the directives, without having the oral interpretation, that oral explanation that Moshe, that Moses gave to the people as directed by God to do so. So yes, we place a trust in Moshe Rabbeinu, and we place a trust that this was transmitted from God to the Jewish people via Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, why didn't God write it clearly? Why didn't he write the mezuzah? You should be, he should write it clearly. He should say, this is the way you make a mezuzah. He writes it ambiguous. From the ambiguity, you can't have the slightest idea how it comes to a mezuzah, unless you accept the principle that I just shared with you, that Moses was taught by God, and this is the way God explained him, and that's why for the last 3,300 years, every mezuzah that has ever been found looks like that. That's why every pair of tefillin, do you know that in Masada they say they found a pair of tefillin? I remember when I took my school to Masada, it took a school that I had in Ottawa to Masada in 2006. It took all the students, actually only all those that, that were willing to buy tickets. And uh, we went with 26 students. You think that's easy, 26 teenage boys going with them to, to, to Israel? And we were told that they found a pair of tefillin. Masada, 1,900 years ago. Nobody has ever found a pair of tefillin that looks different than the tefillin. Nobody has ever found and uncovered a mikveh, which was uncovered in Masada, that looks different than the laws and uh, traditions of mikveh, of ritual area, and so on and so forth. So this is important. God did not write it clearly because the interpretation of law, there's a difference between explanation and then to interpret and address new issues that will arise. And Judaism was not meant to be a fundamentalist religion, but a dynamic religion that lets room for interpretation and explanation. And therefore, I want you to turn to another page. The next page. Uh, not the back side, but the next page that says, one of these set of rules is found in the Siddur. There is something that is called Yud Gimel, the 13 hermeneutic rules of interpretation. Hermeneutic rules. Hermeneutic means the ability and the rules to interpret. This page, this page, the one that has these 13 rules, in every sitter that exists today throughout the world that has an unabridged sitter, the passage, this passage is said right before the morning prayer begins. Whether it's Shabbat, whether it's the weekdays, 
Rabbi Shmuel Omer Bishloy Shesre Midas Hatayda Nidreshes Mikavu Chaimrik Zei Rishapa. I'm not going to explain to you each one, but I want you to just look at this and understand. These rules were given by Moses, by God to Moses at Sinai, that whenever a new situation will develop and you need to interpret, does it fit with the will of God and ethics and morality as defined by God's will as expressed in the Torah or not, they have to be able to dissect that information and that law and retrace its step using one of these logical ways of interpretation. That means interpretation is necessary. If the Torah would have been everything written in a way that it's crystal clear, then there would be no room for anything new to be interpreted. There would be no room to be able to understand not only now, but there would be no way to interpret anything that was new that cropped up in the last 2,000, 3,000 years. The Torah is still being interpreted today and explained. What is the Jewish position on birth control? What is the Jewish position on artificial insemination? What is the Jewish position on liver transplant? What is the Jewish position on countless issues of law? When you go to Israel, sometimes if you stay at a hotel, you'll see a sign. This elevator qualifies to be used on Shabbat as a kosher Shabbat elevator whether you're familiar with that term or not. But that means there's a law that is constantly, especially in a modern state, especially in a state where you have technology, you have modernity, and they have constant issues. So that means the, the ability to still be a dynamic force and not stuck in a rut of just being what it says in the Torah, in the book, that was something that needed to be accomplished by having an oral dimension, an oral transmission of law. And, uh, and this is something that was essential for Judaism to still be able to function in our time and our age. There is a statement that is said that in the transmission of the law, Moses received not only the oral interpretation of what existed, but Koma, how many of you speak Hebrew? Okay. Any statement of Torah, I'm going to say it directly in English, that will be given in future generations from Moses' time was given over to Moses at Sinai. That means in 2012, on the Jewish calendar 5,772, if anyone in this room will come with an original new thought and interpretation of Torah. If it is genuine, it was given to Moses at Sinai. How can that be? How is that possible? That almost doesn't make sense. And I want to share with you, again, a passage from the Talmud that deals with this. The passage is in the Gemara Menachis. It's in one of the tractates. And it says as follows. When Moses went up to Sinai, because that is our tradition. Moses saw, the, the Hebrew term is like this, He saw that God was touching up the letters that were in the Torah, that were to be given in the Decalogue, putting crowns on them. Now, have any of you participated in the mitzvah of writing a Sefer Torah? Have any of you taken a good look at the parchment of the Sefer Torah, of the scroll? The letters that are written in a certain manner, and there are many letters that have crowns, that have points to them, and it's not just uh, the scribe's flair for art history, but there's a prescribed way that letters have to be written in the Torah. And so this homily from the Talmud tells us of God was making letters. He was writing and putting the crowns on the letter. And Moses asked him, this homily says, why are you doing this, God? Who needs them? And God answered him, there's going to be a Jew who's going to live many generations from now. His name is Akiva, the famous Rabbi Akiva. And he will <coughs> interpret mountains and mountains of laws from each crowd. In the Hebrew, it has a magnificent flow in the Talmud, the I hope I'm doing justice to it, now I'm conveying it in English. 
And then Moses said, you know what? By God, he didn't say by gosh. He said, I'd love to meet this guy, Rabbi Akiva. Now he wouldn't live till, till many, many years, over a thousand years later. So God said, no problem, turn around. Moses turned around and all of a sudden he saw the house of study of Rabbi Akiva with the students of Rabbi Akiva leading the house of study. And God said, take a seat. And he walked over there. This is all in the Gemara in Menachas, page 29a. You can, you know, I'm giving you the sources. You, they have English uh, art scroll and they have Judaic press Gemaras here. And he walked over and he sat down and Moses listened. There was a dialogue and a debate and a discussion going on. He sat there for 15 minutes and the Gemara says, Chol Shadaita. He became depressed. Why did he become depressed? He didn't understand one word what they were talking about. They were interpreting law and he didn't understand. This is what the Talmud does. He didn't understand. Chol Shadaita. He didn't understand what was going on. Suddenly, Somebody asked Rabbi Akiva a question. The one, the, the, the dean of the school, the famous Rabbi Akiva, I don't know if any of you have been to Israel, visited his gravesite in Tiberias. And they asked him a question, and Rabbi Akiva said, the answer to this question on Jewish law is, Halocho Misina. This was the law that Moses gave us at Sinai, and there's no other reason why we do it. For example, why are Tvilin black? Halocho Misina. A talis, you can make any color you want, even though they're traditional talisim. But tefillin have to be black. Halacha l'moishu misina means a law that was given over by Moses at Sinai, and this law exists only because Moses told them, that's the way God taught me to do it. And when Moses heard those words, it says he became comforted. He said, he feels a little better. And he turned back around to God. Now here, what is the meaning of this? And I'm going to give you an explanation that you will not hear unless you learn the commentaries of the Talmud. Moses did not understand the language of the interpretation that he was listening to in Rabbi Akiva's house of study because Moses received the Torah as a prophecy. God gave it to him because he was the greatest prophet that ever lived. And God gave him a gift of understanding the laws and how they're to be practiced. Rabbi Akiva's house of study interpreted law using extrapolation, using interpretation, using their minds, not using prophecy, using their understandings. So they came to the same bottom line of law, of practice. But Moses came to it not through intellectual interpretation, extrapolation, but he came to it through God gave him this gift as a prophecy. Now, I don't know if you're interested in all of this information that I'm giving you, but I think it's important to recognize this. It's important to understand that our Torah and our tradition has been transmitted and that this transmission is in an ongoing state because many different laws and traditions and practices and anything new that you can come up with, any question, am I allowed to go on a bus on a Shabbos? Am I allowed to do this or that? Whatever it is, everything is a matter of the interpretation of Jewish law and the explanation. What does Jewish law say on this? And I'm going to give you now the basic rules of how this thing functions. Basic rule number one. Moses explained what God taught him. Basic rule number two. Anything that wasn't in that explanation that was new to Moses, he used the 13 principles, the hermeneutic laws, how to interpret something that God didn't tell him what to do. So one and two, the Jewish people had basic laws which were explicit in the Torah and they were explained by Moses why, what you're supposed to do. Point number two, these 13 principles of interpretation. Point number three, there are certain things we do only because it's a halacha, a tradition that Moses gave, gave us over at Sinai. Moses passed away. Who is the new leader after Moses? Joshua, Yehoshua. So Yehoshua had this rule. He followed anything that they heard from Moshe, anything they heard from Moses, that was the law. There was no debate on it. Anything new, they used the 13 principles of interpretation. Moses didn't teach us about this. <clears throat> if Moses taught them about it, then it was law. And so it went, do you want to see that little video? Yeah. It looks like fun, what is it? <coughs>
Jewish video from the Rochester Habana <laughs> Sniper. Point number three, Joshua, what did he do? Joshua then had the process in hand of being able to deal with interpreting law, and so it is in every future generation till this very day, these same principles work. Now, one more thing I have to add. The one more thing I have to add is as follows. There is a verse in the Torah, and I don't know if it's in our master list, that gave Moshe, Moses, or Moshe, the Hebrew name, the power to interpret the law. And the power not only to interpret, but the power to add on new rules. There is a verse in the Torah that says, Vishamartem is mishmarti, you shall guard my mitzvahs. If Moshe felt he wanted to add on a certain observance that isn't one of the 613 mitzvahs, and in any generation as a protection that Judaism should not be forgotten, he could do it. And what is one of the most famous laws that Moses added on? That you should read the Torah. That you should read from the Torah. That three days should not go by that you shouldn't read the Torah. And many other laws, but this is the most famous. Because all of us are familiar with the reading of the Torah. Whether it's on Shabbat, whether it's on Mondays or Thursdays, whether it's on a holiday, whether it's a fast day. Now the cycle that Moses established is not the cycle that we use today that was established by Ezra or later generations, but nevertheless, this power to add something on as a protection, this was given over also to Moshe Rabbeinu. Now what do they do a thousand years after Moshe? And what do they do if in the process of interpretation, because the inter interpretation is fluid and we could have different opinions, and what happens if you have two intelligent people or ten intelligent people and five say like this and six say like this or four? I mean, it, you can't tell me that everybody's going to interpret the law in the exact same manner. So this we have a biblical explicit injunction that tells us achrei rabim that at the bottom line you go after the majority rule. That means if you have people who buy into the fact that the Torah is divine, people who buy into the fact that we have the 13 principles of interpretation, people who try to interpret by tracing back to the roots of the Torah and tracing back to various different precedents, and they come to loggerheads that they're stuck, so we have the basic rule, majority rules. Majority opinion rules. And this is the way Judaism has functioned for the last 3,000 years. Now. What about the question that I started off, the pivotal question? And I'm coming to the wrap-up. And this, I want you to take a look at your last page in the pink pamphlet. What a funny name, the pink pamphlet. Huh? It's pretty. Was there not a movie, The Pink Panther or something? Anyways, what happens if everything is dependent on rabbinical interpretation? Right? If everything is a, is a human interpretation, we all understand the basic premises. Human beings make mistakes. And what happens if the majority opinion was wrong? What happens if Einstein, the Torah sage, was sitting there, and he happened to be smarter than everybody else and interpreted better, and the other nine opinions who said it's nine against one, they were wrong. And they outvoted him nine to one. So I want to tell you again a story from the top. There was a very great sage. His name was Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkanus. He was a giant of a scholar and a genius of a human. And he once debated with one of his colleagues. They were disciples. That, they were rabbis that lived uh, in the first and second century. And he had a debate on a, a specific law. And he was, his, his main chief opponent in the debate was a person that he loved that was his friend. His name was... Rabbi Yehoshua. And they were debating an issue, and Rabbi El 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 Elazar ben Hurkanes was so sure of his position, he said these words, if I am right, let the wind outside blow the leaves off the tree. And suddenly a big wind started to blow, and the trees and the leaves started to blow off. And, and Rabbi Yehoshua, you know, this is pretty intimidating. And Rabbi Yeshua say, we do not go Jewish law. We do not render verdicts of Jewish law based on winds blowing. 
He said, if I am right, the stream that flows next to the house of study should start flowing backwards. And immediately somebody ran down to the stream and it's flowing backwards. And, the, and Rabbi Yeshua was not intimidated. He said, we do not go in Jewish law based on streams going backwards. And he says, if I am right, let a heavenly voice, what is called a bat kol, call out from heaven, my name. And a heavenly voice calls out, Rabbi Elazar ben Horkinus is right. And he says, Jewish law does not go after heavenly voices. We have a verse in the Torah that tells us, Achrei Rabim Lahatos, that you go after the majority opinion when we've come and we've followed all the procedures, which I haven't really articulated each one of them, but I'm not, I'm not going to. So this last text, and he, and by the way, he was perhaps right. This is from a book, a sefer that's called the Sefer Achinoch. It's called the Book of Education. It was written 600 years ago. It was written by a father as a legacy to his son explaining all the mitzvahs. And if you see on page 18, 19, you see on page 19, which is the English, mitzvah 496, there is a verse in the Torah that says, Loisosur, you shall not turn after the words of interpretation of the rabbis, of the masters, not to alter from right to left. I'm just trying to figure where's the next page of this. Oh my gosh, hold on, it's upside down and inside out. One second. Oh yeah, page, page, find page 21. Okay, so go from 19 and find 21, even if you have to turn it upside down. You should not change the words of the interpretation that the rabbis have given you, the based in, the leaders, the authorities, or evade their charge about any subject in the Torah. And if you read the next sentence on page 21, about this it is stated, you shall not turn aside from the word which they shall declare to you, either to the right or to the left. And in the commentaries, and if you'll read this, and I don't expect you to read it now, but you'll read it. It says, even if they tell you right is left and left is right, you have to listen if it's the majority opinion. But what if they're wrong? What if they're wrong? And he explains like this, because everybody has a mind and everybody has an ability to interpret. If you were going to sanction somebody saying, but I am right, really, and not follow the rule of majority, so you'll have millions of different religions and ways to practice. And it is better, and it is the responsibility of those rabbis to make the right rendering of decisions, but it is far worse if everybody will start interpreting on their own. Because then after a hundred years, after five hundred years, after a thousand years, you won't know what the religion looks like. And therefore, to prevent chaos, better that they should have an error at the one time, but the principle of following the basic instruction of rendering the law because it's, it's virtually impossible to conceive that every day there should have been a mistake. <coughs> I'm gonna conclude with a story. You've been pretty good because I've been pretty tough on you tonight. <coughs> I've given you a lot of information. And when I'm lecturing in a university or lecturing to seniors in a high school, well, high school is different. I have to deal with hormones. But when I'm lecturing, I don't have to deal with hormones here tonight. When I'm lecturing in a university so I can speak and I, I, we, we take notes, students who are listening, whether they're adults or, or, or university students. So I, you've been a tremendous audience, but I want to conclude with a story. I'm from Cleveland, I'm born in Cleveland, Ohio. The Buckeye State. I'm a Cleveland Indian, oh no, that's not important, but I'm Indians, you know, Browns, I'm Cleveland. And in Cleveland, there was a very famous philanthropist. Very, very famous. You've heard of him, his name? Irving Stone. Irving Stone was the president and people think the founder of American Greetings, and he was. American Greetings, the second largest greeting cards company in the world. He was an Orthodox Jew. His real name was not Stone. His real name was Saperstein. And I knew his father. His father lived to a ripe old age of 106. He lived to a ripe old age of 102. And he was a very generous person and kind person. When he retired, from, he started off selling apples on street corners with his dad. 
And my father, a blessed memory, used to tell me that when he went to school, they used to say he was a very poor student. God forgive me, I don't mean anything, Irving. But he was a poor student, and they used to say, the teachers used to scream, Irving, Irving, what's going to become of you? What's going to become of you? You're such a poor student. And from apples that he sold with his father, he expanded it to greeting cards, and the rest is history. That he became one of the wealthiest Jews in America. He was asked a question a few years before he passed on. What are the most memorable moments and your greatest achievement in life? Pretty important question. Because his philanthropy was not only to Jewish causes, it was to everything. To hospitals, to boys and girls clubs, to all types of, 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 uh, of, of beneficiary that benefit the community. And he said, I have two achievements that are considered to, by me the hallmark of my life. Achievement one, that a chumash was dedicated in my name, the stone chumash. He says, can you imagine little me from Cleveland, Ohio, tens of thousands of chumashim are used every day and every Shabbat that are called the stone chumash, the blue art scroll chumash. It's called the stone chumash. And to me, that's a tremendous achievement. I never went to Jewish school. I went only to public school. And that today, people are studying from the stone Komish. And he said, the second achievement of my life is that there is a city in Israel that I attempted and I sponsored. It's a city called Tells Stone. It's about uh, 10 miles one of the suburbs of Jerusalem. And he said, what got me into this? Because that city that today in Israel is called Tel Stone had a different name. Its biblical name was Kiryat Ya'arim. Kiryat Ya'arim, the town of forests. And in the book of prophets, in the book of Chronicles, it tells that before King David built up Jerusalem as the home of the temple that stood in Jerusalem, which was built by his son, King Solomon, the Ark of the Covenant, the Oren Kodesh, that had the tablets, sat in Kiryat Ya'arim for 20 years. And he said, can you imagine this place where the Ark of the Covenant of the Mishkan that Moses' tablets and the second tablets, that was in the city that has my name to it. That is the greatest honor that I have. That and the Chumash. And I share with you this story because we are all part and parcel of that Jewish world and Jewish community. And we are all indivisible as being part of the Jewish people. And our practices and our observances, whether we do one mitzvah out of 613, by the way, you can't do 613 mitzvahs today. There's only about 200 plus that are applicable today. So you're ahead of the game by 400. You don't have to worry about it. Everything you do to strengthen your Jewish life and Jewish consciousness is putting up your fist to the world and saying, Jewish people are still here. We survived, and we will survive forever. Amen. Thank you. Questions, please? I don't care what you ask. You can ask me about sushi. I'll tell you. I want a few questions. Disagreement. Nothing? Not one? OK, we'll go down to one. One question. Yes. My take is certainly the original practice was much simplified. But my understanding is there were a number of fences and safeguards that were put in, in the Middle Ages that made Judaism much more delicious than it is today. Absolutely. What we're seeing is really, and it's not so much the Torah Judaism that we saw in Moses' time, but the result of the rabbis of the Middle Ages concerned about Christianity and trying to build fences around the practice to, to maintain. Judaism as much as they could in a hostile environment. It's a very, very important point that you brought up. And I want to give you 
because I'm not going to disagree with your point. I'm not necessarily agreeing with it, but I want to just give you a context. Logically, rationally, according to anthropology, the Jewish people should not exist. There are many anti-Semitic historians who are perplexed, how do the Jews exist? They're tiny in numbers. They've been persecuted. Everything that happened to the Jews is a recipe for disappearing and not the recipe for thriving. And there's something unbelievable that happened by the Jews. The temple was destroyed, the first temple, by the Babylonians. The Jews were either killed or carted off as slaves or they went down to live in subjugation in Babylon. They were foreigners. And instead of dissipating and disappearing, they thrived. What is the greatest work that we have of Jewish law? The Babylonian Talmud. The greatest work of Jewish law. Yes, it came historically, chronologically later, but wait a minute. You speak about persecuted people. You speak about injustice. You speak in the United States about the black, the Afro-American community. You speak about the Mexicans and the Latinos. You speak about communities that didn't really get a fair shake. Did the Jews get a fair shake? Did you ever read the book, The Shame of It All? A magnificent book. And it talks about Moses Mendelssohn. A, a, a German Jewish historian writes a story how Moses Mendelssohn, when he came to Berlin for the first time, he was not allowed entrance to the entrance that humans walked in. He had to go, because he was a Jew, the entrance that was only for pigs and cattle and Jews. How did the Jews do it? All of the issues. Now, either they, they, they persecuted us, or they made it, there's so many stories of, 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 of opportunity that would have been open for Jew if he abandoned his faith. And what is amazing is as follows. When the Jews went into Babylon, those Jews who were the remnants of the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, because the other ten tribes assimilated already after their defeat by the Assyrians, those Jews who kept the practice of Jewish traditions they remained Jews because not only merely a blessing of God. If your home <coughs> ate kosher, for example, so even though you were in Babylon, your kids grew up knowing we're different. We eat kosher. We eat a lot of vegetables. <laughs> we have to have somebody shecht our turkey or our chicken, our meat. A Jew that had a mezuzah on his door, he knew that his house was different. That means if you just take a look at the fringe benefit of Jewish consciousness and awareness that kept the Jew and made it possible for him to live in a sea that rejected him and in an environment that would swallow him up. And you ask the question, well, how did he survive? So when the rabbis made these extra fences, even though some of them today would say, well, we're living in America, and we're et cetera, et cetera. These fences helped us bring ourselves to this day. And I want to tell you a very interesting point about a fence that was made. Fences that were made or traditions that were added can be removed. If it was given with a reason to it, it says we're going to do this and this because of this and this, it became law. But if the reason is no more applicable, and it says a court that is as significant in numbers and in wisdom comes along, they can remove that. If, however, the rabbis enacted a tradition to be practiced, that they, and they didn't give a reason, they didn't give a reason is because they didn't want it tampered with. And they wanted it to be perfect. There are three mitzvahs in the Torah, and the precedent is from the Torah. There are three mitzvahs in the Torah, and only three, that there's a reason given why we observe these mitzvahs. And all three of them, somebody came along, took the reason, and violated it, because he said, it doesn't apply to me. What are the three mitzvahs? They all deal with the Jewish king. There's a king should not have too many wives. It says a king should not have too many horses. 
and it says a king should not live too opulent a life. Three mitzvahs, and it says why for each one. When it says tefillin, it doesn't say why. Shabbos, it says yes, because it's, it's, it's uh, telling us, you know, to remind us that a God created the, the world in, 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 in six days, and so on and so forth. But I'm saying a mitzvah of some type of a practice, different than a testimonial, Testimonial, it has to tell you what we're, what we're testifying, what we're, what we're saluting. But a mitzvah, these three mitzvahs, it tells us reason, came along King Solomon. And he said, very important, the king shouldn't have too much wives because they'll bring uh, idolatry into his house. He says, this applies to everybody else, it doesn't apply to him. King shouldn't have too many horses because he'll end up going and pursuing horses in Egypt and we don't want Jews running back to Egypt. Solomon said, it doesn't apply to him. And he did it. He says, I'm smarter than that. It won't happen to me. And it did. And opulence, the end was that because of Solomon's opulence, his son lost the kingdom. And the Jewish people split into two different kingdoms. So therefore, when the rabbis wanted to enact a law that nobody should tamper with that law, they did not give the reason. So your question is very profound. And many times I wonder at myself at some of these traditions and mitzvahs. And, and some, some of the things like even dealing with meat and milk. According to the biblical injunction, you're not allowed to eat meat and milk. And what is chicken? Chicken is a rabbinic law. Why did they make that rabbinic law of chicken? Because they said if you're going to allow people to eat chicken, the person might not see it's chicken, and, and he might say you're allowed to do milk, milk and meat too. If you see anybody eating chicken and milk today, you know he doesn't practice Judaism. So there, there are certain injunctions that the rabbis made true to protect the integrity of the core of the religion. The fact of the matter is that Am Yisrael Chai, you are a beautiful community. One question was good enough for five. And enjoy your sushi. And I look forward, if you're ever in Los Angeles, I can't provide you sushi, but I can provide you good discussions and coffee. Have a wonderful, successful, and happy Purim. God bless the rabbis who make this Chabad house so vibrant, so warm, so family-oriented, and so caring. And you're a wonderful community, and we should be able to hear of good news from Jewish people. Peace in Israel, and everybody can answer. Amen. Amen. Shavuot Tov. Thank you very much, Ladies and gentlemen, as I promised you, the sushi came. I want to tell you, there is a huge storm in Buffalo. This is truth. There's a blizzard in Buffalo and in Syria County. No, it's here. No, it's not here. The blizzard's not here. I don't know. Give it the sushi. is right here. But the reason why I came late was because that he was driving through this blizzard. But Baruch Hashem, better late than ever. That's right. Yeah. Right now. I, I